Добрый вечер. Рада вас приветствовать в Центре современного искусства «Винзавод». Сегодня мы продолжаем наш цикл «Новые космологии». Тема нашей лекции – цифровая философия. Я рада приветствовать нашего спикера Александра Гэллоуэя. Александр Гэллоуэй является профессором философии, исследующим проблемы технологии и теории медиации. Он также является программистом, ардеятелем, профессором медиа, культуры и коммуникации Нью-Йоркского университета. Александр написал несколько книг о цифровых медиа и критической теории, включая «Эффект интерфейса» и «Лориэль» против цифрового. Сейчас я передам слово моему скуратору Андрею Шанталю, который ведет в курс сегодняшнего мероприятия. Спасибо. Я хотел сказать буквально пару слов о контексте сегодняшней встречи. Сегодня можно часто услышать о том, как новые технологии, цифровые технологии влияют на каждый аспект нашего существования, на экономику, на социальные отношения, на производство восприятия искусства, они проникают внутрь человеческого тела, они инкорпорируются в геологическую летопись. Но, как мне лично кажется, не всегда эти утверждения достаточно оправданы и убедительны. И есть также другой момент, что философия часто равнодушна и не заинтересована в осмыслении новых технологий. Достаточно вспомнить философию 20 века и Гильбера Симондона, например, гениального философа, который разработал систему индивидуации и писал о способе существования технических объектов, и который остался неизвестным, ну, его был открыт, по сути, только уже после своей смерти. И осмысление новых медиа, осмысление цифровых технологий обычно делегируется другим сферам, таким как теория новых медиа, дигитальная литература и разным другим областям периферийного знания, именно периферийного по отношению к философии. И в этом смысле идея Александра Голови стоит особняком, потому что он не просто осмысляет философским образом осмысляет а, цифровые технологии, но и переосмысляет саму философию с точки зрения а, дигитальности, с точки зрения а, цифровых технологий. А, и в этом смысле я бы сказал, что его методология отчасти пересекается с тем, что сделал Дереда в 60-е годы, когда он а, предложил переосмыслить а, западную метафизическую традицию с точки зрения а, письма. Письмо он понимал, как вы помните, как эпистему, а, при помощи чего он смог а, открыть некие вытесненные или ускользающие смыслы и интенции а, философской традиции. То, что при, при, предлагает сделать Гэллоуи, а, основано на достаточно простой а, параллели, а, что а, метафизика — как и цифровые технологии, занимается тем, что разделяет а, единое на множественное. И почему, а, мне кажется, а, это выступление достаточно а, важным и центральным для нашего цикла, а наш цикл, я напомню, новой космологии посвящен а, возвращению больших нарративов а, в противовес а, специализации узкопрофильных знаний, а, тем, что этот принцип разделения а, единого на множественное, подобно тому, как это происходит в цифровых технологиях, где а, происходит разделение на ноль и единицу, а, мы также обнаруживаем в других областях, как в биологии, а, где ДНК кодируется на основе четырех элементов а, в семиотике. И что мне показалось любопытным, в одной из лекций а, Александр Галуи также а, рассматривал а, философские категории, а, используя метафору стандартной модели, которая, а, как вы знаете, а, используется в современной физике. А, ну и на этом я передаю слово нашему гостю и прошу вас поприветствовать его. Well, thank you, uh, Andre. Thank you for that um, that uh, wonderful introduction, very detailed, um, and also to Anastasia and and to Nina for um, helping this event and bringing me here. <laughs> Closer, okay. Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, 
It's a pleasure to be here uh, in uh, Vinzavod and uh, to be here in Moscow, in Russia. Um, this is my first trip to Russia, and hopefully I will be able to return again in the future. Um, I, I want to speak uh, today about the concept of the digital, um, and uh, this seems like a very simple question. Um, a question as simple as what is the digital, um, I think is a, a simple question, but maybe a question that has not been completely answered yet. Um, so right now in my uh, seminar in New York, we are um, addressing the question, what is the digital and what is the analog? Um, but there's a, a special uh, exception, which is we're trying to define the terms without referring to the computer. So to define the digital without referring to the computer, the digital strictly as a philosophical concept. So that is really the goal for me um, here in this lecture this evening. First, a frank assessment. There are very few books on new media worth reading. Now, I wrote that sentence five years ago partly out of frustration with the lack of, in my opinion, real intellectual debates around computation and digitality. Of course, good debates are invigorating. That digital media studies has thus far proved too few real debates is at least partial explanation for its sluggish development, prematurely sunk by a buoyant enthusiasm for all things digital, or halted by the endless repetition of slogans like everything is connected or information wants to be free. So I've been the target, of course, of some of this kind of debate. Um, for instance, when the Dutch master of digital theory, Hert Lovink, suggested that my knowledge of ancient Greek myth was about the same as the average German high school student. And I've had other disappointments. Um, for instance, I took it very personally when one of the, the great cinema scholars in America once called me a conservative in front of a whole um, full auditorium, and that was seven years ago, and it still uh, is something that I think about. Um, but I think the, 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 the best, uh, the peak epithet would probably be when a book reviewer assessed my book on the work of Francois Laruelle as, and the phrase he used was, fractally wrong. So like a fractal, fractally wrong, which I assume means wrong at all levels of scale. So as I said, good debates are invigorating and a lot has changed in the last uh, several years since I first wrote that statement. And I think a golden age of tech theory, tech philosophy, like you said, um, I think is maybe happening right now, um, at least in my immediate context in the English-speaking world, and maybe you can tell me if it's the same here in Russia. Um, and because of that, I think we can expect the future to be um, fruitful years for tech philosophy. Already, already a decade ago, uh, scholars helped inaugurate a new field of inquiry dubbed critical code studies, a disciplinary shift that was evident in the English-speaking world, um, scholarship focusing on the, the specific details of software. In fact, someone like Lev Manovich, I think, is an important figure in this, uh, in this school. At the same time, uh, there's been a renewed interest in infrastructure, and this has guided a number of important recent books in media studies. Books on, for example, fiber optic cables, 
um, or books on cloud computing. And some theorists have recently explored the various philosophical nuances of the digital, fueled often by, um, as you suggested, the, the philosophy of Simondon, um, or uh, more recently, perhaps, uh, Bernard Stiegler in France. And while feminist theory has long engaged with digital technology, the recent Xenofeminist Manifesto has echoed particularly widely, I think, due in no small measure to a series of staunch positions taken by the manifesto's authors on controversial topics such as alienation and posthumanism. Even in the world of art criticism, computational and network aesthetics have come to the foreground, exemplified by the wide dispersion of a pamphlet by the artist Seth Price, and the pamphlet was simply called Dispersion, or in a different way by recent volumes on networks and participation from critics like David Jocelet and Claire Bishop. Meanwhile, amid this embarrassment of riches, amid all of this activity, and no doubt also due to it, I think recent philosophy appears all too often as a kind of great disruption a great undoing of existing techniques and methods. And you may know in, in Silicon Valley, the, the concept of disruption is often used um, in a positive sense. Too often, that is, as a kind of retrograde motion or a looking backward, despite being advertised as innovative and anticipatory. So, for instance, one recent trend in philosophical circles, speculative realism, seeks to disrupt Kantianism, to undo Kantianism. While another in literary circles, the digital humanities, seeks to undo hermeneutics. Critique, I think, is the target of both of these disruptions. So we could speak about Kant and Kant's critical method for the determination of human limits, or the deployment of critique in hermeneutics as a way to reveal the latent conditions of worldly phenomena, a technique that is perhaps more uh, Marxian or Freudian than Kantian, but those two um, uh, sources of uh, the modern critical method uh, from Kant and from Marx. Of course, there are many ways to think about the digital. And much of my previous frustration had to do with the tendency for thinkers to convert the digital machine into something else entirely, into a body or into a person, into a some kind of cultural phenomena, cultural artifact, or into a social relation. Those kinds of approaches are fine, of course, and I've even tried to contribute in some ways. But around the year 2010, I began to shift my thinking substantially on the question of the digital. And it, it became clear to me that the key question for the digital is really the concept of number. So not all numbers, perhaps, but um, the integers and a very specific understanding of number. So we have the integers, but also the, the natural and rational modes of number that are derived from the integers, uh, the rational numbers. So for me, digitality requires an investigation into the nature of number, 
Um, and I think like in, in, in English, it's maybe more difficult because um, the word digital doesn't necessarily mean number. Um, but with, uh, with Zifravoy or in French with numérique, I think both of these terms have a concept of number sort of embedded inside the word. But it, in English, there's more of a, of a, of a journey <laughs> that needs to take place perhaps. So what are the most philosophically important numbers? What kind of numbers do philosophers care about? Heidegger has his fourfold. For Deleuze and Guattari, it was a thousand, but of course it could have been more. For Alain Badiou, the multiple plays its role, as does infinity. For Hegel, the triad and the operation of the negative. For Irigaray, it is sometimes two and sometimes not one. For La Roelle, there's only two numerical concepts that are necessary. The one and then the dual, what he calls the dual. For others, it's not the dual, but the binary. And for others still, the key numerical concept is simply nothing. But does the digital have a number? And if so, which is it? I've recently started defending a very particular, if not peculiar, definition of the digital. And I won't bore you with all of the details of how I derived the definition, um, but the definition is as follows. The digital means the one divides into two. And that's all. It's a very simple definition. The one divides into two. So through this, the digital means two-ness, we could say maybe making two, the making of the two, and also beyond the two to the multiple. So two, three, four, multiple. In essence, it's about distinction, about a act of making discrete. Any instance in which separation or distinction form the essential substrate of the medium. So a concept like difference, I think, is absolutely uh, essential to the definition of the digital. From this perspective, the digital doesn't mean Facebook, it doesn't mean Google, it doesn't mean virtual reality, it doesn't even mean the computer, because, of course, there are analog computers, like sundials or slide rules. Digital means the digits. So in, in English, the digital, digital means the digits, the fingers and the toes. And since we have discrete numbers of fingers and toes, um, the digital has come to mean, by extension, any mode of representation rooted in individually separate and distinct units. So the natural numbers like one, two, three, four are aptly labeled digital because they are separate and distinct. But the arc of a bird in flight is not because it is smooth and continuous. A strip of film, film celluloid, is correctly called digital because it contains distinct breaks between each frame. But perhaps the photographic frames themselves are not because they record continuously variable intensities of light. 
But of course, even this point is controversial for some people who prefer to focus on the photographic uh, grain, the, the small kind of chemical dots. Um, and then there are the atomists who will say that it is digital all the way down. Now, in this uh, investigation, as you might imagine, my explorations have led directly to one figure, to the French philosopher Alain Badiou. So I want to speak a little bit about Badiou tonight. And you also probably know, if you've read any Alain Badiou, you know that he has engaged extensively uh, with, perhaps not with the digital, but with mathematics and philosophy. And while Badiou rarely talks about computers, he, he rarely talks about the digital by name, I think he actually has said a great deal about the philosophical basis of digitality. So I will read a short quotation here that summarizes these two um, notions. Since its very origins, Badiou wrote in Being an Event, philosophy has interrogated the abyss which separates numerical discretization from the geometrical continuum. From Plato to Husserl, passing by the magnificent developments of Hegel's logic, the strictly inexhaustible theme of the dialectic of the discontinuous and the continuous occurs time and time again. So that's the, the quote from Badiou. So this, 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 um, these two categories, the discontinuous and the continuous, numerical discretization, and geometrical continuum. Those two categories are very important for me. And if Badiou is correct here, then we have arrived at the heart of the matter. A major discovery, or shall we say rediscovery, of a distinction that has existed since the ancients rediscovered by the Russian-born Georg Cantor, rediscovered again by Badiou, and now reiterated here in slightly different language. Discontinuous and continuous, but also digitality and analogicity, I think these are elemental modes of philosophy. Digitality and analogicity are two elemental modes, yes. But the claim is in fact even stronger than that. The claim is that the digital and the analog are the two modes, and there is nothing in between them. The two-ness here I think is very important. But equally important is the fact that there are only two and nothing in between. In other words, what Cantor discovered, and he asserted this in his famous continuum hypothesis, is not simply that there are two sizes of infinity. So this is the famous um, scandal uh, um, that there are different sizes of infinity. That is important, but I think there's another part of the story that's also important. That there are two entirely distinct modes of abstraction. Two entirely distinct modes of abstraction. The mode of abstraction evident in the natural numbers and the mode evident in the real numbers. So the, for Cantor, the natural numbers gave us a conception of infinity, but the secondary conception of infinity through the real numbers um, was qualitatively different. 
So we could perhaps talk about natural abstraction, the abstraction of discretization. So this would be digital abstraction versus real abstraction. Real abstraction is the abstraction within continuity. And what Badiou doesn't exactly say, but I think implies, is that if there are two entirely distinct modes of abstraction, then there are two modes of philosophy. Two philosophies, not one. And we could perhaps talk about a natural philosophy and a real philosophy, um, or a, a, a digital philosophy and a, an analog philosophy. And this distinction between the natural and the real, um, this to me is very interesting because uh, at least in the English speaking world during post-modernity, um, the, the debate was quite often between the real and simulation, between the real and the hyper-real. And it seems to me that this completely changes the debate um, toward a different orientation, the, the real and the natural. So what are these two, two modes? Um, how do we understand these two different modes? Perhaps uh, it would be useful to talk about poetry on the one hand and mathematics on the other hand. So Badiou has been interested in poetry and literature throughout his very, now very long career. But in recent years, you may know that he's been turning much more closely toward poetry. And this kind of a turn presents something of a problem for Badiou, because Badiou is a Platonist. And we, we remember Plato's skepticism toward poetry and his preference for mathematics. So it seems that these two things are not exactly equal. Um, but what is poetry? What is mathematics? For Badiou, poetry is a marker for the event, for life for the real, for what Jacques Lacan called the impossible. By contrast, mathematics is the space of the precise letter, of argument, of proof, of learning and training. And this is directly after the original Greek meaning of mathesis, of formal abstraction in its most rigorous articulation. So already notorious for his defense of mathematics as ontology, Badiou has become a bit more even-handed, I think, on the question of math versus poem, uh, poetry, the mathem versus the poem preferring instead in, in recent, uh, some recent lectures to describe philosophy as between poetry and mathematics. So it's not a preference, but philosophy is between poetry and mathematics. In its essence, poetry is an attempt to touch the real continuum of life. And as Badiou argues, there is no poem that does not in some way describe an event. While at the same time, mathematics is an attempt to abstract away from the real continuum into the realm of consistency, name, rule, identity, but perhaps this contrast is overstated. Poetry is, of course, impossible to define in its totality without reference to 
rule and rhyme to abstraction and figuration in poetry. And likewise, mathematics spans both of these domains. There has existed since the ancients a mathematics of the analogical, of the real continuum, as well as a mathematics of the proper name and rule. The former is a mathematics of pure difference, while the latter a mathematics of pure identity. The former a math about time, and often directly in time, as with uh, something like calculus, while the latter formalizes time to a sufficient degree as to be able to purge time entirely and to replace time with space. But what, name, what names do we have for this? Geometry is the name given to the mathematics of real difference. Geometry deals directly with the pure continuum of the world, and thus appears most commonly as continuity in line or curve. Geometry deals with magnitudes and proportions, with figures and shapes. Geometry produces images, and I think constitutes a kind of image thinking. It produces images literally, but also figuratively. At the same time, geometry suspends number, and thus, in some way, puts abstraction into question. And I'm suggesting the contemporary name for geometry is the analog is analogicity. And tomorrow I'll be giving uh, a lecture at, at Moscow State University that will be kind of the second, uh, the second this, is, this is focused on the digital and the lecture uh, tomorrow will be focused on the analog. So we have geometry. What is the other name? The other name is arithmetic. Arithmetic is the name given to the mathematics of simple identity. Arithmetic starts with numbers, with counting, and thus relies on a fundamental individuation of entities under some rule of identity. Arithmetic proceeds under the sign of the letter, the symbol, and thus tends toward, I think, a kind of text thinking or symbol thinking, aiming at the production of texts. Arithmetic transcends the real continuum and thus constitutes both the act and living body of abstraction. And as I'm suggesting, the common name a kind of synonym for the digital uh, for ar arithmetic today is the digital. Of course, at this point, I should give a, an, an important uh, caveat and mention that there are lots of exceptions to um, uh, to 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 these to this distinction. Um, of course, there are many mixtures of geometry and arithmetic. And some of the most interesting mathematical developments have come from mathematicians who think geometry through arithmetic, or indeed think arithmetic through geometry. That's an important caveat. Another important one is that um, geometry and arithmetic, when they appear, they both tend to appear together at the same time. And just at the point where you think geometry is most prevalent, you will surely find arithmetic details. Likewise, the most highly evolved arithmetic will tend to in, in, invert into 
pure geometry. And so a good example here would be uh, a wave form, um, which is often cited as the kind of purest form of analog representation. But even in a wave form, uh, it would be natural to talk about, uh, for example, frequency, or to talk about a singularity point at the point, for example, where the slope reaches a certain, um, where the slope reaches a certain um, uh, uh, value. So even the waveform kind of naturally converts into regular discrete arithmetic um, units. Or on the other hand, and on the other hand, we could talk about code, digital code, and even here we have um, the uh, a kind of threat of noise and static and bugs, computer bugs, um, the, the threat of the real, as, as uh, Friedrich Kittler uh, might have called it. So we might be able to map poetry and mathematics onto these two domains that I was just describing. Poetry comes to signify the continuum. It signifies the analog branches of mathematics. So the most famous branches would be uh, calculus and also topology, but there are other ones too. Um, the real numbers, uh, the, the real number system. And hence, it comes to signify geometry in the, in the kind of original Greek sense that I've been outlining here. By contrast, mathematics comes to signify a kind of subset of mathematics, um, this idea of the integers, of numerical discretization, uh, the digits, the integers, the rational numbers, the rational number system in general. That is, it comes to signify arithmetic in the classical sense. So this may be a little confusing, but for me, in some ways, mathematics is ultimately on the side of a subset of mathematics, uh, the, the rational um, number system and the mathematics that is derived from the rational number system. In other words, there seems to be a mathematics of the poetic real and a mathematics that is more fully mathematical. The mathematics of the poetic real gestures outward from discrete number to the continuous curve. So in calculus, you have the use of differentials in order to mathematically solve continuous curves. So we have a mathematics of the poetic real, but we also have uh, a mathematics that is focused on um, blocks, units, discrete entities like the integers. So recall now the, the fabled inscription on Plato's Academy, a very famous inscription. And the inscription said, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. Let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. It's, it's a geometritas. The a, a geometrical. Let no one who is a geometrical um, enter here. But for a philosopher like Badiou, this always was confusing for me because for a philosopher like Badiou, in my reading of Badiou, um, it's always a question ultimately of arithmetic, not geometry. So for Badiou, it's a question of number, of count, of the count of, for example, his theory of points, right? It's not a theory of continuity, it's a theory of points. Uh, Brian Masumi, one of the uh, early translators of Deleuze into English, Brian Masumi once wrote a book chapter in, in, in homage to his master Deleuze, and he called the chapter, On the Superiority of the Analog 
on the superiority of the analog. But for someone like Badiou, it would have to be the reverse, I think. Something like on the superiority of the digital. Again, the digital defined as arithmetic and discrete number. So I would say that with this ge geometric and arithmetic um, definitions in mind, I would say that Badiou is a digital thinker in an age that is dominated, in fact, by analog philosophy. Um, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow. I, I think we're actually, as much as we're surrounded by digital technologies, I think in philosophy, we are in an analog era. We are in an analog phase. And so Badiou is a digital thinker in an age dominated by analog philosophy. Of course, by labeling him a digital thinker, it is not to suggest that Badiou has written about computers, because he more or less has not, as far as I can tell. Um, nor do I wish to suggest that he is somehow allied with the school that is actually called digital philosophy, um, which tends to be um, uh, uh, mathematicians and, and physicists and, and engineers um, quite often. Um, and he's not associated with that school at all. For me, this moniker is simply meant as a, characteristic, a way of characterizing the way a general tendency of thinking. In fact, it might be one way of interpreting Badiou's fidelity to Maoism, which is a it's somewhat controversial point, Badiou's fidelity to Maoism. The Maoist interpretation of the dialectic favored the moment of analysis. In fact, the moment when the one divides into two. And so sometimes I, I condense this into just sort of one into two. And this moment of analysis from one into two is nothing else than the digital. And this was the exact definition I gave of the digital before. So while Badiou is an arithmetic thinker first and foremost, not a geometric thinker like someone like Deleuze, mere number has never been Badiou's ultimate desire. So the series of books under the heading Being an Event, for instance, is organized around a fundamental choice. And he describes the choice using different words, um, either a predictable, rational, constructible universe, or an indiscernible universe of the generic real. Either the state or the event. Or, as he will put it in the, the forthcoming volume three of Being an Event, Kurt Gödel or Paul Cohen. Gödel being um, one of the mathematicians who contributed um, the, the, the philosophy of, of the constructible. Um, and Paul Cohen, uh, one of the mathematicians who developed the concept of the generic. So we have the constructible universe or the generic universe. And we know Badiou's answer is emphatic. He says, I choose Paul Cohen. I choose the generic. So this is an important distinction. We have a philosopher who is, uh, uh, in my mind, an arithmetic thinker devoted to digital philosophy. Nevertheless, he chooses the generic. So as Badiou says, Plato's math theme, Plato's mathematics, interrupted the ancient poetry, the old Homeric poem. But perhaps now in the 20th century, we have a new interruption, where the generic seems to have interrupted the old math theme, leading to a kind of poetry 
of the indiscernible real. And what makes Badiou so interesting and what differentiates him from the more romantic uh, philosophies of the real is that, and I think this is very impressive, that Badiou arrives at his conclusions strictly within mathematics. He never, as it were, cheats by exiting mathematics. So when a painter or a poet uh, discovers the real in the wilderness, in the, in the wildness of nature, we could talk about a kind of feat of poetic mastery. But Badiou has discovered it within pure number. And this is, I think, f f uh, f fantastic. He begins with pure digitality and then in some ways ends with a kind of, uh, ends by, by, touching, <laughs> by touching the analog, perhaps. So how could we interpret this dynamic, this uh, turn toward poetry, toward uh, the absolute? Or if I could be so presumptuous as to speculate about a book that is not yet published, and I think not even yet finished, um, what could we anticipate in volume three of being an event uh, being an event three, and the subtitle is The Imminence of Truths. The Imminence of Truths. It's, it's very strange to hear a word like imminence be connected with, with Badiou. Um, so we have a kind of strange new vocabulary. Perhaps not, uh, perhaps words like the infinite or the absolute are not strange, but imminence the imminence of truths. So if in the past, Badiou was faithful to, as I said, the, the Maoist Chinese Marxist uh, tradition, perhaps now he's something like a good Soviet. Instead, favoring the moment of synthesis, the operation of the two integrates as one. And we could use this perhaps as a definition of the analog, not the one dividing into two, but the two uh, integrating as one, the moment of synthesis. And so I think perhaps Badiou is becoming more Russian in his, in his old age, I think. Imminence, of course, has a very special set of meanings. We could talk about Deleuze. We could talk about Spinoza. Um, in contemporary, uh, well, uh, in, in recent French uh, philosophy, figures like Michel Henry and Francois Laruelle, for, for me, are, are, are very interesting on the question of imminence. So, so why imminence? We know that imminence is a way for philosophers to think about uh, generic identity, a kind of indiscernible real. And it is no different for Badiou. And in fact, in this third volume of Being an Event, he will finally address generic identity directly. However, what's interesting is he still breaks with the poetic tradition. So he's still maybe nervous about that. Um, he breaks with what he calls the pathos of finitude. And the new volume is devoted to the concept of infinity. And so while some thinkers want to approach the generic through finitude, Badiou does something different. He gets the generic through infinity. Okay, so a final question. What is the relationship ultimately between philosophy and the digital? And so here's where it's a little bit more speculative, maybe. So what does Badiou mean when he claims that mathematics is ontology? This is the very notorious claim. Does he mean that the world is uh, at root mathematical? Is he, a, is he a Pythagorean? Of course not. This is not what he is saying. What he is saying is that if you ask philosophical questions, 
you will naturally tend to speak in the language of mathematics. So you'll have to ask a question like, what is the one? What is not one? What is the difference between the one and the multiple? And so in his analysis, these are mathematical questions. What is the one? So this is maybe the, the direct or strong interpretation of Badiou's claim that mathematics is ontology. But I think there's also a weak interpretation. Um, maybe uh, an interpretation that doesn't require um, uh, um, accepting mathematics so, so fully in a philosophical sense. So a weak interpretation exists as well. And this is less commonly discussed, but I think it might be more persuasive, ultimately. And this interpretation attempts to understand the word math through its Greek etymology in words like mathesis and mathemata. Such Greek terms do not necessarily mean math in today's parlance. In Greek, Mathesis simply means education or learning. Mathemata refers to a lesson in school, a school lesson, which means something that you learn. Mathesis does not mean exclusively numerical learning, right? It doesn't mean just geometry or calculus, but rather the whole act of learning as a whole, the act of gaining knowledge in general. And I think Badiou, Badiou knows this, of course, and I think he allows himself to be kind of uh, misunderstood, perhaps, on this point. Because if we were to say, um, if, we, if, 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 if to say that philosophy is spoken in the language of mathematics is to say, in essence, that philosophy takes place in the education of the mind. And defined in, these, in this way, the, his notorious claim loses some of its controversial uh, connotation, I think. If mathesis is simply education or learning, simply the cultivation of abstraction, right? The cultivation of abstraction of whatever kind, mathematical or in some other way. Then to say that philosophy is the language of mathematics is to say that philosophy is spoken in the language of the cultivation of abstraction. So this is maybe a much less controversial claim. Here, Badiou sounds, in fact, a little bit like Heidegger, particularly Heidegger's notion that being furnishes itself to thought, right? So this idea of, of mathification means basically this, that being furnishes itself to abstraction, to the cultivation of, abs of abstraction. Or indeed, if not Heidegger, then Badiou sounds like his great hero Socrates, particularly the Socratic notion that philosophy is the sincere pursuit of truth. So I like this. In, in the weak interpretation, it's not necessary to um, you know, adopt set theory or anything so technical. We only need to acknowledge um, education or learning, and that's a way to understand um, this focus on math, on mathification. But still, a more powerful thesis deduces from this. Um, and this is my very last kind of very speculative point. Um, and I think perhaps we could christen it, we could give it a name, and we could call this Badiou's principle, Badiou's principle, which is that mathification means the distinction between the digital and the analog. So math means 
the distinction between the digital and the analog. Why? Well, because the distinction between the digital and the analog is, in fact, what we call abstraction. So following my previous uh, observation about the, the root of mathematics in the cultivation of abstraction, perhaps that differential between the non-abstract and the abstract is in fact what mathematics is. So it's an, it's an unusual definition. We're defining mathematics using terms from mathematics, but I think it's, I think it's useful. Of course, there are different uh, schools of thought here um, around the question of abstraction. And I hinted at this earlier uh, with the, the difference between natural abstraction and real abstraction. Um, there are, there's one school, a kind of metaphysical school, where the idea is that the analog is the real, but abstraction is something that transcends the real in a very strong way. Um, there's another school of thought, someone I think like Deleuze would be a, a good example here, which is much more strictly physical or material. And the idea here is that abstraction is never transcendental. It always stays absolutely within the real. So the notion of real abstraction. So if, if Deleuze is a good ambassador for the second school, um, Badiou, I think, is, is a fitting representative for the first school. For Badiou, and Badiou is a metaphysician, un unapologetically so, right? For Badiou, the digital is abstract in a way that the analog is not. The analogical mode of abstraction for Badiou is, is dumb, it's direct, it's rote, it's repetitive. And if you remember Badiou's book on Deleuze from 1997, he's, the, the worst word that he could, that he could, uh, that he could think of to insult uh, Deleuze would be to call him monotonous, right? So for him, the analog was monotonous. There was no way to break um, apart from the analog uh, real. But the digital mode of abstraction is complex, it is superlative, it is emergent. It is in fact, I think, a kind of modernist concept in Badiou. It quite literally creates subjects. So we can have a debate about this, of course, um, but let's first admire what Badiou gains from his unbridled enthusiasm for the digital. Abstraction becomes a kind of bridge between the digital and the analog. And to move from the analog to the digital is to enter abstraction, is to enter mathesis, to enter mathematics. And I think this is maybe uh, what ultimately what Badiou means by mathification. So what we get from this, and here's the biggest kind of speculative leap, is not simply the claim that mathematics is ontology. So this is, again, yes, very controversial, uh, notorious claim. It's ambitious, it's, it's radical in its own way, very all-encompassing. We get another thing, which is that we get a definition of mathematics itself. We're not just getting a definition of ontology, we're getting a definition of mathematics. So it's almost a kind of meta-mathematical claim. So math is defined as the difference between the digital and the analog. Uh, we could also say math is defined as the difference between the real numbers and the natural numbers. So again, the theme of the real and the natural um, um, uh, re reappear. To move from the analog to the digital is to enter mathematics. In other words, 
if a mathesis, if, if a learner, if a student understands the difference between the real and the natural, the learner necessarily understands mathematics as such. So, while Badiou, I think, should be characterized as a digital and arithmetic thinker first and foremost, I do think that's true. With the next large book, with Being an Event 3, I believe he will have finally written his treatise on geometry. And he will finally be able to say with confidence, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. The arithmetical path and the geometrical path, while both beckoning perhaps in his work thus far, will ultimately converge into a single enterprise in the third volume. The strict formalization of sublime infinity will provide a picture of the imminent generic real. So I thank you for your uh, very warm hospitality and welcome here in Moscow, and I look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, Александр, за выступление. Ну что, перейдем к вопросам. А, у нас будут вопросы. Так. Мы не услышим, просто нам нужно перевести эти вопросы еще. Хорошо, да. Okay. Um, uh, are you connecting uh, digital uh, with the traffic and the numbers with the big data? With big data. Yeah. You s the, the first was, am I connecting uh, digital? Uh, are you um, uh, do you feel the connection uh, digital and traffic as we talk about new media? Yeah. And... Uh, numbers and big data yeah yeah uh, yes absolutely um, uh, absolutely and I mean this is this is uh, one of the reasons why the digital is so significant from a so from a sociological or, or political perspective um, absolutely I mean one one thing that I find interesting is um, you know if, if we adopt this definition of the digital, it means that we have to open our historical uh, window. The historical window has to be much, much, much larger. And we have to think about something like big data in the context of a very long philosophical tradition that includes language, symbolic representation. Um, absolutely, so I see big data as a kind of mechanized evolution of a very, very long history. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. How do you see the author of the the Если мы говорим про буддизм, то буддизм изобрел ноль, ну, индийцы изобрели ноль, и на этом строится буддизм, как бы ничто, да? И э, можем ли мы говорить о религиозном влиянии тоже? Потому что религии и философии все равно как-то перетекали. В средневековье на философию очень сильно влияла э, каббалистика, такой квантовый компьютер в поисках Бога. То есть э, можем ли мы говорить об этом тоже? Yes, this, this is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and there, there are a lot of, I think, ways to answer this question. Um, and I'm not sure I understand all of them myself. Um, I will say that uh, the religious tradition has directly engaged um, a lot of these questions. So either through the concept of the one, which has a very old, um, uh, tradition within um, religious thought, 
so neo from Neoplatonism, um, we could also even talk about mysticism and the way in which mysticism kind of reinvents a concept of the one. Um, and you, you mentioned nothing, nothingness, yeah. Um, um, yeah, and then the second part of the question, I'm forgetting the second part of the question. Um, you said Buddhism and... Just one moment to <laughs> repeat the question once again. То есть это будет не совсем вопрос. Можно ли, да, я просто уже дальше побегу. Можно ли трактовать так, что получается человечество всегда было в цифровой реальности, потому что так или иначе мы существуем в математике, да, в математическом мире, и получается мы сейчас просто в цифровом, то есть мы сейчас цифры превратили в технологии, но изначально мы и были в цифровой реальности. И критиковать, что человечество перешло в некую цифровую форму и потеряло себя, это несколько неправильно, потому что мы и были в цифровом мире с самого начала. И попытка постичь реальность, это практически это как бы постичь цифровую реальность. То есть кто такой Бог, единый и так далее. Спасибо. Oh, right, and then the, you asked about uh, uh, qu the quantum, you had a, I think part of the original question was about uh, quantum computers, right? And, yeah. th and that, that, right, that was the part that I was trying to remember. It, uh, that's very significant because it, uh, it, 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 it takes some of the essential um, elements of this discussion, um, but then renders the relationship in a very different way. So instead of a strict dialectical question, analysis or synthesis, you have the notion, for instance, of superposition, where two elements can be, or more, right, can be um, rendered uh, in, uh, you know, that, that can be simultaneously superposed at the same time. And it's only at the moment of measurement or intervention that you have a reduction from this super superposition into some sort of um, discrete measurable fact. Yeah, so that's very interesting. And it, and it changes the, the, the conception. Um, yeah. Thank you. У нас есть еще вопросы в зале? А мы сейчас расскажем. Нет больше вопросов? Есть еще, да? Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question, a uh, well, really basic one. What is the politics of the digital? Because in a certain way, like the digital, as you described, is pretty much similar to this kind of large social symbolic structure of, of post-Marxism, like in like Lao or Zizek or something like this. So, in, yeah. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So I think there's a, a kind of, um, you know, we can answer the question anthropologically, sociologically, uh, and we could talk about, um, for instance, new kinds of political movements that get facilitated by digital technologies, right? And we could characterize them in very different ways. So, um, you know, logical exploits, hacking, uh, viruses, viral phenomena, um, you know, certain kinds of mass movements that are that are facilitated. Um, but I think there's another way to answer the question too, which is not to discount the first first idea, which is that, um, and and this this it might take a longer uh, time to 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 explain this, but um, I actually think that the political as a condition follows the logic of the digital. Whereas something like the ethical as a condition follows the logic of the analog. Meaning the digital, um, I, I've already defined the digital through the, the idea of kind of uh, uh, distinction, breaking apart, balkanization, fracturing, creating um, uh, factions, right? And this, I think, is, is part of the essence of the political mode. Um, instituting a distinction between friend and foe. Um, being polemical, right, means there's a distinction between a condition and an opposition. 
And so, um, in a kind of in a kind of technical sense, I think actually the political and the digital are closely related, whereas something like the ethical follows the logic of the analog because the ethical is about dissolving distinction in favor of some kind of cataclysmic singular principle, right? So love, love thy neighbor. Um, so I think that would be a, those are two ways to answer that question. Мы ответили на вопрос. Не совсем? Да. Thank you very much. Ну что, у нас будут еще вопросы, да? Thank you for the lecture. And uh, my question is, uh, you talked about the poetry and uh, but you and the poetry. But what can you say about the analog and digital in music? Yeah. Oh, this is very difficult, very difficult question. Um, well, first of all, I am not an expert in music, so I, um, but I think it's difficult because um, I think there's a tendency to think of music, but also more specifically to think of sound either directly as an analog phenomena or to use to rely on very specific um, analogical uh, qualities and descriptions. So we could talk about um, resonance or we could talk about um, the, the importance of waves in sound, right? Um, so, you know, there are no digital microphones and there are no digital speakers. It's all, you know, vibrations of diaphragms, right? So this is, this is a very important issue, I think. Um, so you could say that sound and, and perhaps also music is, has, a, has a very, very close relationship to the analog. But, like I said at the beginning, at the time that you find, that you think you have found a perfect analogical condition, right? sound waves propagating through air, um, then that's the spot where you find digitality. Um, so for instance, um, for instance, the root of um, arithmetic is the same root that we get in words like rhythm, right? Which is about the punctuation of a particular, of a particular, right? The sound becomes punctuated at a particular points. And so there's a kind of digitality that's embedded in, in analogicity. Um, but that's a, a huge, huge question. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, uh, my question concerns, again, uh, the quantum reality. And uh, how, uh, in your opinion, the digital philosophy uh, can change uh, you know, in quantum era? Uh, with taking uh, into account the notion of uh, superposition? Yeah. Um, this is a good question. I, I don't think I am smart enough to answer this question. Um, but I did, I did ask my friend uh, about, who's a chemist and who understands um, quantum mechanics much better than I do. And, you know, he reminded me, in fact, that, uh, and some of the digital philosophers, they will use quantum mechanics as evidence for a kind of fundamental digitality of the universe, right? So they're making ontological claims that the universe itself is digital, and so therefore it can be a computer and all these other things, but what is their evidence for that? And they, they use quantum mechanics. Why? Because the, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the energy state of what, you know, the electron energy state can only be, or it tends to settle in discrete energy states, right? So these are, you know, perhaps some kind of waveform, some kind of standing waveform or energy form. Nevertheless, like when you pluck a guitar string, right, it will fall into a single waveform. Or if you were to take a harmonic in the center, you could have a standing wave that's half the length. But these are discrete states. So I think it really depends who you ask. And also, maybe it is a political question, right? Are you, are you siding with this, um, with this proposal from fundamental physics that the world itself settles into discrete states? Yeah. 
Thank you, Alexander. Um, ну что, у нас uh, последние вопросы? Если нет, да. Скажите, пожалуйста, вы говорили про определение и определение математики и определили ее как различие между аналоговым, нет, между натуральным и реальным числом. Это все? Ну, то есть это все определение математики? Или я не понял до конца? Uh, yes, а, а вам не кажется, что это неоконченное определение? Ну, это как определить, допустим, дверь как э, различие между э, ну, батареей, которая сейчас так нужна, и собачьим холодом, который за окном. Э, вот. Ну, вопрос в этом. Я просто не понимаю немножко, что такое математика в этом смысле. Well, of course, this is bad use principle. It's not my principle. Um, Yeah, I mean, maybe it's maybe it's not a useful definition of mathematics. That's that's very possible, um, but it is it is I think um, I don't know. It's a consequence. It's a theorem, right? It's a consequence of this particular set of questions, um, and I and I like it because it in fact um, opens up the connection between mathematics and philosophy in ways that I think um, haven't been explored. Yeah. So, so maybe it's a it's a way of reducing mathematics and treating mathematics in a very simplistic way. Yes, I think that's that's true. Maybe trying to determine the essence, the essence of mathematics. Yeah. Ну что, дорогие посетители, если вы не хотите воспользоваться последней возможностью задать вопросы, а вот сразу появились. Кирилл, так. Thank you for your lecture and. I have one question. Um, what do you think uh, about relation between software and hardware? How we can understand this intense relation between? Uh, how we can understand this one? I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's an excellent question. The uh, you know, so Friedrich Kittler famously said, you know, there is no there is no software, and and the 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 idea there was that. Anything that we call software is always already instantiated in a, in a physical level. And I'm very sympathetic to that argument, in fact. Um, I think that, um, that the study of actually existing digital technologies like computers is great, can, can benefit greatly from um, an understanding of how hardware works directly, right? And that there isn't a dramatic difference between the organization of, let's say, a certain kind of circuit, um, a certain arrangement of, of logic gates, right? And um, a, a few lines of, of code that get written, right? Um, and, and perhaps those, the arrangement between hardware and software is really a question of, of transcoding. It's not, it's not a philosophical difference, right? It's a, it's a material difference. Um, So yeah, I think I would I think I would prefer to kind of collapse hardware and software together instead of having this kind of um, metaphysical uh, distinction that often gets um, proposed and, and repeated, right? And the reason why I think that's a, a problem is that um, I think it allows uh, software to be kind of to, to sort of mystify the machine. Um, instead of allowing us to have a direct understanding of the machine. Спасибо. Но я до вас не добегу, спускайтесь. Подождите, пожалуйста. Подождите, подождите, мы все-таки с микрофоном должны, потому что нам переводить. Сейчас мы подарим. Вопрос горел. Вопрос про искусственный интеллект и философию. 
есть много опасений у разных деятелей, что искусственный интеллект, он может как-то возобладать над человечеством и так далее. Есть ли философские какие-то решения, предложены ли какие-то тезисы, определения для вот этого, этой проблемы? И на тему разделения человечества, опять же, на аналоговую часть, которая живет в природе, и цифровую, которая хочет перейти в мир ну, искусственного интеллекта. И сингулярити. В общем, это единство, или как это называется? Мы сейчас переведем и постараемся ответить на этот вопрос. Спасибо. I mean, it, it's oftentimes the, the story about how artificial intelligence is going to take over um, I don't know, I think is, 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 uh, has, a, has a strong sort of political and ideological component to it. And We've been hearing this story for, you know, um, for decades already. Uh, and in my seminar, we were reading some of the early criticisms of artificial intelligence. Um, in fact, using philosophy, uh, using phenomenology to argue um, against the ability for computers to adequately model the world. Um, and I think those early arguments were, were successful. Um, although research in artificial intelligence, um, because those early criticisms were successful, had to completely change its approach. And it, in fact, became much more cellular and distributed. And um, So I don't know, perhaps we need, instead of an artificial intelligence based on digitality, maybe, as you're suggesting, we need one that is based on the analog, a kind of artificial intelligence of the analog. Um, or maybe, maybe a, a software rooted in analog principles rather than rooted in digital principles. Спасибо за вопрос. Я думаю, у нас уже последние два вопроса тогда будет, да? Спасибо большое. Вопрос следующий. Если мы принимаем во внимание, что цифровое это установление различий, как мы выявили, как быть, и приведение, и это является такой сверхабстракцией, абстрактным, как быть с пониманием таких явлений, например, социального, социального сплочения, понятия как сплоченности, которое является абсолютно абстрактным явлением, но при этом предполагает установление или разграничение, преодоление разграничений. Как быть в случае, когда мы переводим понятие цифры в анализ абстрактных понятий социального? Спасибо. Yeah, so this is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and I mean, I, I did make reference to this concept of the generic very briefly, but I didn't have a chance to explain it. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very old question, the political question. What, what does it mean to deal, to have real difference, right? It's back to the earlier point about uh, the political and the digital. What does it mean to have real difference? But then what does it mean to have some kind of community or communion or commonality through, through real difference? And um, there are a lot of different ways to respond to that. I mean, I think historically, um, one way to respond to it is, is to try to identify some sort of universal condition or a transcendental condition that would, as it were, kind of cut through difference or, or move in a transcendental way across difference. Um, I personally am much more interested in this work in Badiou, but also in someone like Laruelle, uh, around the concept of the generic, which is less about sort of expanding and, 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 and transcending the specific um, differences of, of, of individual entities or, or people into some sort of general universal category, right? Um, in fact, it's a kind of reverse, uh, reverse approach where instead of taking something that is the universal and having every political actor have to participate in that universal, um, the generic tries to kind of subtract, perhaps, 
instead of add or, or inflate, to kind of subtract or to reduce, to um, create a notion of subjectivity even that is um, insufficient rather than sufficient for all. Um, and that model of the generic, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a much more interesting way to think about this relationship between um, this, this political question about difference and commonality. Спасибо. У вас был, да, вопрос? Вильям Дэвис в своей книге «Индустрия счастья» писал, что цифровые подходы часто лишают людей их личной свободы, поскольку в мозге мы находим либо ноль единиц нейрон, либо возбужден, либо нет. Делают людей отдельными и заставляют людей измерять свой уровень счастья, превращать свои эмоции в цифру и отделяют людей друг от друга. Тем самым часто этический вопрос отходит на второй план. Есть ли какие-то философские подходы, которые позволяют нам вернуть дискуссию об этике, об объединении людей, их взаимодействии в группе в наших новых цифровых условиях? Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I find that that there's a, there's a common. Um, I think it's I think it's common for. Um, sorry, I made reference to kind of a romantic uh, response to the digital, right? So there's this notion that the digital is about abstraction. It's about creating some kind of somehow false or um, dehumanizing scenario. And so then romanticism is a way of, of kind of cutting back against that. And so, yes, we could map that onto a, if you will, um, a desire to solve the problems of the digital through the analog. I think that's a very, very common approach. But I think what your question is, is suggesting is, um, Are there other narratives? Are there other approaches, right? Um, one, one thing I was kind of hinting at with Badiou, which is why he's so fascinating, I think, is that he doesn't fall into that romantic trap at all. Um, and he finds his generic, he finds his event uh, strictly within his reading of mathematics, right? So it's a kind of arithmetic recipe for the creation of the generic, which I find very, very interesting. Um, but there's even a, 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 so that would be kind of taking it in the other direction, but I think there's even a, a third alternative, which we, we haven't even talked about, which would be the alternative provided by um, La Ruelle, which would be instead of continuing to participate in some sort of, um, you know, some sort of endless, centuries-long, millennial-long war between, uh, you know, discontinuity and continuity between the digital and the analog, what if there's another mode of thinking that uh, withdraws from that fundamental condition? Um, so maybe we could start talking about a kind of non-standard approach to the distinction between the digital and the analog, and that would be um, a, third, a third option. Спасибо, Александр. Ну что, я думаю, что мы на сегодня закончим. Спасибо всем за ваши вопросы.